In this episode of Ham Radio Q&A, I answer your questions, so please stick around for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Wow, a lot of things are happening on this channel. So we just passed the 10,000 subscriber mark and I've been picking up about 50 new subscribers a day. So thank you so very much for that support. I really appreciate it. I also appreciate the intelligent comments and great questions I receive every day. Sometimes YouTube comments can be sort of a social media wasteland, but I'm always impressed with the quality of comments I receive. It can be a challenge to call out the best, but let's dig into this month's questions. But before we do that, please stick around to the end as I have a preview of some of the things that are going to be happening in the next few weeks. First off, my video on the purported illegal status of Baofeng radios are stirring quite a controversy. Both the original video I posted in August and the October channel update are generating quite a few questions, so here's a few of the better ones. Uh, Robert shares some points that have been echoed by many. Namely, uh, the FCC advisory is silly for many reasons. Number one, there are millions of these radios in daily use. The toothpaste is out of the tube. Number two, custom-built equipment is popular and can transmit outside the ham bands. Three, some expensive commercial equipment can also transmit outside the ham bands with little or no modification. Number four, it is illegal for hams to trans it is legal for hams to transmit outside the ham bands in case of an emergency. In fact, there are cases where someone has been rescued by doing this. And finally, number five, he states, does the FCC want to do away with the Mars program? Well, you bring up some really valid points. The FCC's enforcement advisory is contradictory how the amateur radio service has functioned for over 100 years. Also, I want to say that despite what many say, a radio used on the amateur radio service does not need to be Part 90 certified. I believe the FCC really wants to muddy the, wa the regulatory waters by deliberately creating this confusion. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the MARS program, or Military Auxiliary Radio System. MARS is a radio program sponsored by the Department of Defense and provides supplemental radio services for military. For a long time, MARS operators completed phone patches so that military personnel could talk to loved ones uh, back home. Nowadays, uh, phone patches are really a thing of the past, but um, MARS uh, does uh, still provide uh, interoperability communications between the military and civilian emergency management agencies. The MARS program is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Defense, and the MARS operators receive a special operator's license and call sign and use frequencies outside of the amateur radio service. So the FCC can't control who can modify their radios for MARS operation. Gene asks, someone please tell me which model numbers is, are, are now legal or illegal, and which ones are legal? Well, this is a really tough question, as there is no way to know which radios are allowed under, FCC, under the FCC's enforcement advisory unless the manufacturer or distributor lists the FCC ID in their product description. I'm not going to say that a particular radio is legal or not, as I'm not an attorney, and I really, um, and this advisory really doesn't specify what the FCC considers to be a legal radio uh, for, to be, uh, for use under the amateur radio service. But if the radio carries an FCC ID, you know, you can be reasonably assured and, and assume that the radio is safe and, and, and proper to use on the amateur radio bands. Uh, for other radio services like um, the land mobile radio service, you're going to need to be part nine. The radio is going to need to be part 90 certified and um, part 95 certified if you want to use it for GMRS. To follow up on that point, uh, I also received this comment. The person writes, "I contacted the company where I bought my Baofeng radios, and there's and they said there's our FCC compliant. They even sent me the FCC ID numbers." So the statement that all Baofeng radios are illegal is just not true. You are correct. Some but not all Baofeng type radios do have an FCC ID. If the radio carries an FCC ID, then it can be reasonably assumed that you could legally use the device on the amateur radio bands. So if you don't want to use a Baofeng and, and are looking for something inexpensive, what should you do? As this commenter asks, 
I am very new to ham. If bow fangs are illegal for now, can you recommend a good, low-cost alternative? Even the cheapest Yesu seem to be five times the price of a bow fang, on Amazon at least. At, or at least, what is the best, lowest-cost alternative? Well, Amazon is not necessarily the best or the cheapest price source if you're searching for amateur radio gear from the, menu, from the major manufacturers, such as ICOM, Kenwood, or Yesu. Since amateur radio gear tends to be a niche category, you're going to often find, oftentimes find a better price if you shop the specialty retailers like Ham Radio Outlet, DX Engineering, um, Gigaparts, Universal Radio, it's MTC Trading, etc. Um, yeah, Gigaparts has the Yesu FT4XR for $99.95 with free shipping, or you can get um, the dual band FT70DR for $159. And that's got built-in Yezu System Fusion. Uh, these are all bulletproof radios, and are going to and they're going to give you years of use. In fact, you know they're they're definitely a step above um, what you're going to find with the Chinese imports. While they might be a bit more expensive than um, a comparable Baofeng, you often get what you pay for. So um, they really are a good investment. All right, switching focus. Here's a little bit on troubleshooting. I got a comment uh, recently that that stated I can't seem to get get anyone or hear anyone on my Kenwood TS480 SAT. Not sure if it's the antenna or I pushed the wrong button. I've been, using, I've been off radio for years and a guy set it up for me and it worked. Any ideas? Well, I'm not an expert on that rig, so here's a couple general things you can check if you, if you can't hear a signal on your, on your radio. Uh, the first thing i do would be to check the antenna switch. Um, the TS480 SATs got two antenna ports, antenna one and antenna two. And uh, being on the wrong antenna port or accidentally pressing that switch is a common problem. In fact, our club's got a, a Kenwood TS2000 and I've, um, and uh, being on the antenna has been a common problem I've run into with helping a new operator use it. So if that checks out and you're connected to antenna one and there's an antenna on antenna one, the next step I would do would be to tune the radio to WWV um, at 10 megahertz. That's the atomic clock broadcast out of Boulder, Colorado. Can you hear a signal from that at all? Well, if not, then you may have an antenna issue or there might be something wrong with your transceiver. I also received a couple, I also received a couple of comments on my APRS uh, fill-in digi video. Great video, especially since my club has been talking about digipeters at aid stations in mountainous and ultra marathons in my area. I was looking into building a few um, based on the Arduino and forgot that this may work with some of the stuff that I already have, like the MFJ TNC2 clones and a CAM and a KPC3. Thank you. Well, building a, building a fill in digi is a great way to repurpose old equipment, and sometimes doing that is easier than building something from scratch out of an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Rob says, KB9VBR, great video. This just might be the solution to the uh, Digipeter iGate problem in our area. We do not have an iGate or Digipeter in our county, and I've been wanting to install something for a long time that it would at least allow APRS tracking within our neighborhood and nearby town of Woodville. There is a Digipeter uh, in the county next door, which I think could be activated from my QTH if I put up a small beam. Well, if you don't have a reliable APRS service at your location, I'd probably look at building a, a full-blown Digipeter instead of just the fill-in. Fill-ins work um, only for the first hop, and a true, a true Digi has the extra filtering and um, to reduce congestion and also to help um, remove those duplicate packets. You could host a Digipeter at your home location, and maybe that would be a good starting point to get things rolling, but in the long run, uh, Maybe co-hosting it at a repeater site might be, the, might be the answer. Our local club has a digipeter diplexed onto a UHF repeater system. The repeater uses a dual band antenna, so it was easy to add the digipeter to the same system. That might be an option for you. Chris asked a question about the Wolf River Coils review I did. Any advice for using this with an MFJ 1979? Well, the MFG 1979 is a 16-foot telescoping whip antenna, uh, just like this one here. And basically, um, 
it's, it's great for portable operation. What I do is uh, extend it out to about nine feet uh, for the 75 to 80 meter band, and then collapse it down to about five to six feet for the higher bands. You know, if you're using uh, the 102 inch uh, stainless steel whips um, with that, with this coil, here's the coil. Um, if you use a 102 inch stainless steel whip, um, you'll find that you're gonna run out of tops of, of space on the top end of the band. Uh, the coil here, this only goes up to about 20 meters. So um, you're gonna need to shorten that whip for 10 or 15 meter band bands. Since um, there's a little bit of imprecision when you're using uh, the coils with a whip antenna, uh, oftentimes what I'll do is um, pre-tune everything with an antenna analyzer before I get on the air. Another interesting thing with the whip antenna is that um, if you extend it all the way out to 16 feet, uh, you can use this coil on the 160 meter band, but to do so, you're gonna need a really good uh, ground system uh, to, get a, to get a good match on 160 meters. But hey, give it a shot. Well, that's it for this month's questions. Uh, please keep them coming as your question might be featured next month. As a coming preview, I'm gonna be doing a couple of videos on, um, on mobile radio operation. I bought a new to me car this last month, and I, right now I'm in the process of installing a VHF UHF mobile radio in it. So I'm going to uh, so I'm going to be giving you some tips on antenna installation, running power from the battery, and locating the radio uh, in, unit inside the car itself. Plus, um, be shopping for a new radio. So I'm trying to decide uh, between the ICOM ID5100A or the Yaesu FTM400 XDR. So um, eventually I'll have a review of one of those two rigs coming up. But if you have a personal preference between the two, let me know, I'd love to hear it. Finally, the holiday season is fast approaching and I'll have my annual holiday gift guide out in a couple of weeks. This video highlights ham friendly gifts any amateur lo would love to see under the tree. If, let me know in the comments if there's a particular gift you'd love to receive from Santa. Well, that's it for another month. Uh, for more ham radio articles and information, be sure to check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. And don't forget, uh, if, if you love this video, uh, give me a big thumbs up. I really appreciate that. Uh, check out some of the other videos that are suggested along the side here. And hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Pressing subscribe and, and the bell notification will let you know when future videos are released. I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. Have a great day in 73.